Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, a Senate panel okays a controversial repeal to controversial new election laws. Lawmakers approve a spending package that targets the backlog of uninvestigated CPS cases. And we'll look at why a noted state senator decided against a re-election bid. Those stories and more next on the Journalists Roundtable. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Steve Goldstein of KJZZ Radio, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Mike Sunnix of the Phoenix Business Journal. Well, opponents of new election laws, opponents of the laws, are not pleased that lawmakers are moving toward repealing those laws, which makes absolutely no sense, Steve, except that it does. Ted, I don't want to confuse any of your viewers right now. It reminds me of Charles Barkley, former Phoenix Sun star, talking about he was misquoted in his <laughs> yes. own autobiography. It's as confusing as that. There were so many controversial provisions at the end of the last legislative session related to uh, how many signatures people from different parties, libertarians in particular, needed to get to get on the ballot, which Republicans decided they liked to some extent because they were afraid libertarians were stealing some of their votes, leading to Democrats winning. There were also questions about permanent early voting lists. Who can drop off one's ballot? Ultimately, it passed, went through. So now, after 110,000 valid signatures, even more were turned into the Secretary of State's office to get a referendum on the ballot to overturn it. Now, lawmakers have decided, you know what, let's repeal that before voters even have a chance to overturn it. Except it's not that. Look, if we could be promised as voters, we're going to repeal it. And it's happened before. There have been other things going back to a gas tax back in the 80s. You repeal it, the voters didn't like it. It's the what comes next. Not that I don't trust the legislature, but they're already talking about, you know, well, maybe the permanent early voting list change about how often you get to use that early ballot and how often you have to use it. Maybe we'll put it back as another bill. And maybe the change on the signature requirements for minor parties, we'll put that as another bill, which basically means that the folks who are opposed to it all those 147 thousand signatures they gathered, no bueno por nada, and now they have to go back and start new petition drives, multiple petition drives, to put it back on the ballot. Or they run an initiative with everything, but that takes more, more signatures and, and more work. I mean, it's, it's, it's a function of the Republicans running the show down there. There's no check on them. Um, so the check of the voters, they're going to they're gonna go around that. You could see this for some other issues going forward. Once this works once, other people are going to copy this. It, 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 will it work, though? I, mean, I know Tucson's Republican, Ethan Orr, mm -hmm. who's, who apparently represents, a, a, if not a, a, a middle-of-the-road district, then maybe slightly even Democratic mm -hmm. district. He was holding out. He was, he's not holding out anymore because he says he's had assurances. You, 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 are you hearing assurances? Well, no, and as Howie said, we're hearing it from Eddie Farnsworth. But, he, you know, when we hear these things, there are also things that late in a session, things come up that have been discussed that can be added. So this idea that we should trust what the legislature is doing, I don't know. The, the two names that I find interesting, though, Michelle Reagan, Justin Pierce, both in the legislature, both running for Secretary of State, what is their point of view going to be on this? Michelle Reagan was the sponsor. So now, is she, what does she feel about this, especially going and, to a Secretary of State? And race? Pierce has said at the committee meeting, well, we heard you. You may not like the package, but maybe you, when you signed it, you only dislike some pieces. So leave it to us, your trusted public servants, to figure it out and make sense of it to you. And as I say, the folks who gather 140,000 signatures aren't quite ready to trust. I don't see this being a huge issue at legislative races because a lot of the districts aren't competitive. It's such an inside baseball issue that you know people aren't going to vote based on that. But in the governor's race, Fred Duvall can come out there and say, look, I'll, I'll be a check on the legislature for some of these things and kind of keep some of the silliness from happening, some of the, some of the crazy bills, some of the, the laws that a lot of Arizonans don't like going on down there. This could be an example if he could pair this with some other things and say, look, I, I can be a check on them so they can't get away with things like but this. But you do have enough split districts, Ethan Orr being a prime example. You have enough Republicans who are not in bulletproof districts that if you can deny them those 31 votes in the House or the 16 votes in the Senate, you may be able to do it. And there are a lot of other folks, even in relatively safe districts, let's say Prescott, who are in Republican districts, but do you really want to go back to voters, and some of them are even facing primaries, and say, you know, we know better. 
That's how we got the Voter Protection Act in the first place. They passed the Medical Marijuana Act in, uh, in 96. The legislature said, we know better. And they came back and said, no, we're going to repeal your repealer. And we're going to say you can't monkey with what we I, allow. I think it's just a challenge. How you're right. But I think it's a challenge to get average voters out there to get engaged on this issue and explain this, this to them. Maybe in a governor's race, we can say, look, we've got a legislature that's controlled by one party. It'd be nice to have a check on them. I think that's a more salient thing to voters to grasp on. We had the latest voter, voter registration numbers come out again. Independence growing again in Arizona. But if independents don't vote, much like we talk about the Latino monolith, and that was another issue that came up, that Republicans are thinking, let us not get the potential Latino vote real excited about this. That's another reason they're talking about repealing or want to repeal. Mm -hmm. And I think these impacts are so unknown that we really don't know. I mean, how much, what is known and what is unknown? Don't and and real quickly now, in, in terms of this being legal, are everything okay? Are yes, you oh, I, up here? I think you can always repeal something. You can't say just because voters said we want to repeal, the legislature can't come back and say, well, we'll repeal it first. It is even legal to put it back. It is even legal, as far as I can determine, to put it back in exactly the same fashion Although I would change a comma or two just 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 to cover my my tush on this. So but intent the, intent uh, of the voters intent, intent is is uh, out the window here. Yes, and what what what's to determine voter intent? As as Steve pointed out, there's six seven provisions in here. Can you determine that the people who signed it didn't like one two and six and liked uh, you know four and five? I mean that that's the problem. I think of all the motivators at the legislature, you know, abortion, guns, social issues, spending. Disdain for the voters and their and their will on these things <laughs> drives so many things down there, and you see energy behind that. They, the legislatures do not like these voter mandates. Seems to be a winning formula as well in half the battles. Uh, okay, let's talk about the supplemental uh, spending package, Howie. We got uh, uh, money going to what 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 once was CPS. I mean. And, and then we got this w child welfare report from the care team coming out today saying what was CPS was a dismal failure as if we didn't know that. A lot of stuff going on here. A lot of stuff going on. Um, this is actually the third set of money given to CPS within a 12 month period. I think everybody has recognized that the agency is understaffed. I mean, they have almost a permanent backlog of 10,000 cases. These are cases that have not been touched in two months. What added to this was the 6,500 cases marked NI as not for investigation. No authorization to do that. In fact, the state law says you may not not investigate a case. So the governor came in with some recommendations. Uh, the legislature said, look, it takes six months to bit get people on board anyway, so we're going to give you 126 new caseworkers, uh, another 60 or so uh, staff, support staff and everything else, and we're going to start getting them in. The problem is it goes beyond numbers. The governor, I think, already realized that. She abolished CPS by executive order and created this Division of Youth and Family Services and put Charles Flanagan, who heads the Department of Juvenile and Corrections, in charge of it, and then put him in charge of this care team. He basically said, with the report that came out today, CPS was an accident waiting to happen. He said there were no systems in place. Individuals made individual decisions. They made up their own laws. They ignored the laws, as in the case of this. And what complicated it is there was no quality assurance. Nobody watching to find out. The quality assurance on these ca NI yes. cases was the same people who authorized the NI went back and, oh, hey, we and, did that. And, Mike, you've got a copy there of the Care the Team report. report. Here, I believe right you'll here. find words like, uh, <laughs> very proud of yourself. Uh, systemic failure, lack of accountability, lack of transparency, lack of check and balances, bad decision making, a total revamp needed. That's, a, that's, that's, that's basically getting right to the point, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, it's Super Bowl weekend. There's a, there's a Bill Belichick Patriots phrase, do your job. There's an adjective associated with that, which we want to say on television, do your job. They never do their job. This has gone on for, for a decade. You have reports back from 2003. You had a report in, in 2011 on some of the similar problems. This report talks about this failure mode. This, this thing here yes. looks kind of like Obamacare, Hillary Care type chart. Um, it, it's be, like Howie said, it's institutional, it's personal, it's, it's beyond just being understaffed and overworked. What will keep it, though, from not being institutional with a new agency? Well, e even with people, yeah. in, and they're, and they're going to have checks and balances, I understand this. But ultimately, why should we feel like another government agency, people had their hearts in the right place and, before. And, and that's part of what Andy Biggs, as Senate President, has said. He wants what, what he calls a toes-to-nose examination of the agency says, I don't want to just move the problem over. Hey, we've got a new director. We've got a new quality assurance team. And he wants the, the, the culture there. But one of the, they're also recognizing that, uh, that there needs to be 
better coordination with police, the, 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 these, these care teams to, to work together. But they're also finding, that they're looking deep in the processes. For example, one of the things they found is they have a hotline. Great. 25% of the calls to the hotline, the people were hanging on hold so long, they gave up. Again, so they, nobody knew this before. They also found, 100, even if you got through, 142 places between the hotline call and a case getting involved where the child can fall through the cracks. They need, they, they now recognize that and so to the point of will they fix it? No, but now they know it's there. Well, and I hate to come back to, to just being so cynical because this is one of those things that everyone, so I'm talking to Dana Namark, of course, as we all have many times, and she is not saying people don't want to help. They want to help, they're just not really sure what they're doing. Are there other states Arizona can follow to do this right? Who's doing this right? And then another thing that's come up, Chad Campbell brought this up too, is there going to be money for prevention to teach people not to abuse their kids, for, well, that, for that, drug and alcohol well, abuse? And, 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 and that indeed, was the and issue. The yeah. new agency has family services right there in the title. Are they going to start to pumping well, money back say, into you, family services? You take services? yourself wherever you go. And, and Howie and Steve are right. If they're not going to change anything, it's going to be the same problems. I don't know if I've seen other stories where other states ignored calls. I, don't, I haven't come across one of those. If we all worked for AT&T and somebody called it and we just ignored it, we'd get fired. I don't think anybody's been fired. I think there's a couple people on a paid administrative leave. Mm -hmm. You can't find out what's going on with those people. Well, so well, they haven't replaced anybody. I haven't seen a shift in, in culture other than maybe a new nameplate on, on the agency well, right let me Let me give you two things. Number one, there is a separate investigation being conducted by the Department of Public Safety as to the who. And we're still waiting on that. I talked to Bart Graves today from DPS. He said, no, oh, we're working as fast as we can. How long does it take to work now, on somebody? If you work for a private company, I'm not, now people, I'm surprised I haven't seen some Republicans say privatize this thing at some point. If you work for a private company and you ignore your calls that come in all the time, not, not just child abuse calls, business well, calls, you would lose your job. And, and this has been how many months? And we're still, well, well, that's, still that's slow. Well, that's the point. I mean, when this happened, heads are going to roll. Heads are going to roll. Agency directors still there? Heads seem, seem to be still on shoulders. Well, 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 see, this is a way of, of saving the head of DES mm -hmm. and saying, well, look, we took it out from under his control. And that's a political issue there. Look, your point, though, about the social services is correct. We've got a freeze on in terms of the, uh, the, the child care subsidies the things that allow a child to go to a safe place as opposed to somebody's backyard, that allow the parent to go to work. We, we have not done the prevention for the child abuse program, prevention programs, the domestic violence programs. Uh, but it's the same thing we're fighting all over. We have put so much into prisons. Prisons is, is an ever increasing section of the budget. Have you seen what percentage of the budget is going to, to universities? My, my final thought on this, Ted, is we're still going to have the issue though of turnover has been blamed on the fact there's not enough money. This is a horribly stressful, intense job. Mm -hmm. You're seeing families ripped apart. That's not something you just go home and have a beer and watch a game. People are thinking about this all the time, and but, I don't know how you overcome but that. But if you have 10 cases instead of 20 to follow, okay. if also then one of the more controversial recommendations was to say to all these employees, when you're shifted over to this new agency, we're going to take away the merit protections, but then we'll be able to give you raises based on doing a good job, maybe it'll cut the turnover. That turnover is crucial. It's one out of every five well, caseworkers quits every year. And it's self-perpetuating. The reason so many of them quit is because there's not enough of them, yeah. and the few that are there are overworked. So well, they quit, and there's even at, fewer. If you look at police departments, typical stress, similar stress, pay level a lot better. They have a pension, a retirement. They have some professionalism there uh, within major police departments, maybe not countywide, but, but, but cities. Um, It'd be nice. So, so you, have, you have that there. You don't have this in this agency at all. You don't, it, 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 comes, it goes down to the people there, plus it's systemic. All right, we got to keep moving here, and we'll, of course, uh, as a matter of fact, we will have Flanagan on the, uh, the program Monday. Uh, so we hope to uh, hear more from him on all of that. John McComish is not running for re-election. Why? Well, interesting. I, mean, I think there are several components to this. The fact that he's decided to run for justice of the peace tells us that perhaps he would like to make a little extra money, which he was not making as a public servant, as a state lawmaker. He has also taken a lot of stuff, let's put it that way, in recent years. Is, when that, he, is that the word you were going to use? No. I saw a hesitation But Mike, Mike also censored himself. I will as well. Uh, 2012, he had a Tea Party candidate run against him in the primary. 2014, he would run against Tom Morrissey, former chair of the Republican Party. Uh, I think he just decided if I can make more money as JP and also not take a lot of flack for my, not just support of Medicaid expansion, my leadership on Medicaid expansion, okay. So with what Steve said, surprise to you? Uh, yes, I mean, he, I recognize that once he voted for Medicaid expansion that there was gonna be a, a primary. 
But McComish's district, it's sort of Ahwatukee, uh, Tempe, a little bit of Mason Chandler, is not a radical district, uh, which is part of the reason that Jeff Dow may have a decent chance against the Tom Morrissey. But I think it kind of came down to, look, you know, how I, he said, I've been doing this for 10 years. At some point you say, you know, I'm, I'm, he's majority leader, which means he's spending extra time down there. He's got chores of lining up votes and, and keeping the, the party in line. A party who separated from him on the major issue of last year. Well, he's well, he's 70 years yeah. old. He's been there 10 years. And this is, this is what a lot of business folks look at. He was at the chamber, the Autuki chamber. People aren't reasonable down there. I get a lot of grief. I don't get paid very much. It's a no win. You just get hammered if, if on one issue. Right. That was the, and, and so I think a lot of people will look at that in the business community and kind of you kind of wash your hands of things. I'll go go be a JP. There's a, there's a whole larger issue we've talked about on this table, which is what is the Republican Party or who is the Republican Party? If you were to look at the issue of the state committee or the county committee, a la Mr. McCain, which we'll talk about, you would say, well, they're way over here. But if you look at, let's say, the last time John McCain was up for vote and J.D. Hayworth was against him, you'd say, well, wait a second. That's not who the party mm -hmm. voted for in, in, in the primary. And so you, you have a core of the party that has been very active, that has taken over some of the, the, the power levels, and they're, they're making a lot of decisions. And that's where all the attention is sure. going to be in that primary for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. But a Democrat could take that seat there is very some, There is some, some possibilities for that seat in, in, in the general. But yeah, I think Howie's right. You have these business folks out there, the moderate Republicans out there, that are always talking about, okay, we're, we're going we're to take on the Tea Party and the folks that are far to the right. But they don't have any foot soldiers in that fight because folks like McComish don't want to put up with all the grief they get down there. McComish is an example, I think, of the Medicaid expansion. And we had that mix, once Steve Pierce got bounced as, as state senate president, we had that mix of a mix of Andy Biggs, very conservative, with Driggs and McComish. Now we'll maybe see a change there as well in 2015. All right, since we're on this track, let's get to uh, the state Republican Party censuring John McCain for not being conservative enough and uh, true to McCain's uh, instincts and personality. <laughs> he said, thank you yes. for giving me impetus to run again. I, I, I think he actually said, bite me. <laughs> but it, it, look, the fact is that what John McCain has recognized is after being elected to the U.S. House, after being elected to the U.S. Senate, after running for president, uh, he's not exactly worried about what the A.J. LaFaro's of the world and the Tom What's Morrissey's that, of the world are saying. If he's not worried about them, then what good are they? What are they doing if... if if, well, they're, according they're, to McCain, they're the, they are they're the, so disassociated, and John Kyle, too, called it wacky. If they're so disassociated, what are but, they doing? But they're the foot soldiers. They're the people who can help you get the, the signatures to get nominated. They're the folks who can go out and gather, gather uh, other kinds of petitions. And that's why they're important, because they're the folks you need sometimes to get what you need in signatures and, and fundraising. Those are the folks you need, certainly, for the smaller races. But I was looking back at my notes, because I'm kind of a pack rat. 2007, I interviewed Rob Haney at an Einstein's bagel, by the way. Rob Haney was the Maricopa <laughs> County chair at that point, Republican chair, and talked about he was going to get rid of McCain. McCain was a liberal on immigration. Right before McCain was running for president. And guess what? McCain won the presidential nomination, got reelected as senator. It's a waste of time. I'm not a Republican. Maybe it's not a waste of time to them, but why would you want to weaken this guy who keeps winning and, okay, works with Democrats, but certainly doesn't vote with Democrats no, no, very often? No, I mean, there's no chance he'll ever lose. Um, people vote for him based on his service his name ID, his time in the POW camp. There's a lot of respect, especially from a lot of older voters for that. They're never going to knock him off. And anybody that wants to run against him is just going to wait until, until he retires or, or passes away in, in office. McCain never needed these people. He was never an Arizona guy. You know, he came here, obviously, after the war and married, married Cindy. He's never needed them. He had, was kind of, he's always been ornery, so he's always been willing to get into people's faces. And I think there's still a lot of personal animosity towards him, even after he's mellowed out after all these We years. also got this press release on how he, I, I can't remember his title, but Tom Husband, there was a press release from Tom Husband, who's heavily involved in the, the GOP, who said, you know, people speculated that I, I quit my position because, you know, I'm in support of McCain. He said, no, it's because it's something like mission accomplished or something like that. What is, what is, what, what, what was accomplished? Basically that the he was censured. censured. He was officially censured. Yes. And, and that in 25 cents, as they say. But again, it made the party feel good. Look, so, so much of the red meat for the party is, you know, w w we're intellectually pure. And I don't know if they even care if they go down to defeat. Do, do they care if they don't get the GOP convention any time in the near future because of something like this? Well, it certainly probably doesn't help with some of the folks who are making the decisions that, on one hand, you want to bring the Republican convention to a, to a state that has some Republicans, but also some Democrats, and you fly the flag and do all that stuff. 
do you really want a convention where McCain would be a, have a keynote address and the, your own people outside protesting? Okay, they're booing him. They'd probably <laughs> yeah. be booing him right there on the stage. Yeah, that, that's not exactly the, the optics, as they say, you want. And Ted, very briefly, do we actually believe John McCain needed something to push him to run again? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but I'm sure he took the opportunity, as he always does. Hey, real quickly here, uh, Tom Horn, Attorney mm -hmm. General, uh, reaches a settlement on a whistleblower suit, doesn't reach a settlement on this campaign violation uh, situation. And What's going on here, Howard? Well, this is interesting because, as we've talked about, uh, the, char the charge is that Horn coordinated his 2010 campaign with what was supposed to be an independent expenditure campaign being run by Kathleen Wynne, who had worked for him before and worked for him again. When it looked like Horn was going to lose because of some independent expenditures on behalf of Felicia Rodolini, Kathleen raised about a half a million dollars, took a TV ad for Horn. The argument is based on emails and phone calls. The Avapai County attorney said, look, we have evidence here that suggests they were coordinating. And what that meant is that anything that Kathleen spent was effectively spent by Horn which made him in control of it, which meant he was taking more than $840 from any one source. They did have a settlement conference up in Prescott behind closed doors on Thursday. Uh, I think that Horn wants to get it behind him, but what he couldn't accept is it required an admission of liability. He would have to say, or in print, admit, I violated campaign finance laws. That's the, that's the kind of ammunition that Mark Brnovich has been dying. What, that that having show, to repay $400,000 is not ammunition? No. no. Well, that shows up in, on in a campaign ad for, for in, the, in the primary yeah. or general. If, if, if you, you're the chief legal officer, chief prosecutor in the state, so you're held to a bigger, a higher standard. And, and, and either, either Brnovich or Rodolini would run a pretty good ad with that. If he doesn't admit that, it makes yeah. it a little more murky. Yeah, see, I think and he doesn't think he did anything wrong, too. He's going he's yeah. to stick to that argument all the way through. And, and the 400000 you know, uh, Tom has fair amount of money, but that aside, you, you simply, corporations do this all the time. I, I, I know they do this all the time, but my question is, are, are people so dim that they don't understand that he didn't have to pay the 400000 if, if, if there wasn't a smoking gun there? This is going to hurt him in the Republican primary, because there are going to be enough Republicans who say Mark Brnovich is more pure. Tom Horn, even if he doesn't admit guilt, we know he did something wrong, and, and they'll okay. come up with something. Okay, but, but here, here's, here's the better thing. We're sitting here talking about stuff because we're all political writers. Mark Brnovich already has a T-shirt, which has a picture of somebody in nose and glasses with the line, anyone else would have left a note, referring to the hit and run accident. Right. That's what people understand. People understand hit and run, you know, campaign finance violations. Well, they also understand the fact, or they should understand the fact that Brnovich apparently has raised like $50,000. Horn got more than that from his sister, a loan from his sister, apparently. <laughs> well, it's good yeah, to Horn have a always, yeah. You know what? Horn has always been a really good campaigner, always a fundraiser. He's outsmarted a lot of people. What could happen in this is Brnovich doesn't beat him, but damages him enough, and Rodolini and the Democrats win the seat. Well, uh, uh, Brnovich's people were telling me today, well, we've got some people who are going to come in and help him raise money. Mm -hmm. He is going to have, I think, some help from Republican attorneys general from some other states, which is really an insult to Horn because these are his colleagues. And what about the settlement of the whistleblower suit? How does that play? I think that is potentially more serious, I think, because it sounds as though this Meg Hinchy, who had, who had been in his office, she won this settlement, we don't know how much, uh, based on the fact that after she talked to the FBI about what she thought were independent expenditure violations, that Tom Horn and one of his chief deputies made life very difficult for her. I think that sounds worse because many people feel like a boss bullied me, they're taking, I'm trying to actually be a straight up person, they're picking on me, that might actually have more yeah, The only thing that in Horn's advantage is he, he settled it now, and it's not in June and, or and September. That, or that comes down like that. to the yeah. thing. With, with the lack of a settlement in the campaign finance case, February 10th, we start three, four days of hearings. Right. Another month from that, we get a ruling from the administrative law judge. A month after that, we get an appeal to the Superior Court. All of a sudden, it's August, it's primary time, and this thing keeps bleeding. All right, so with that in mind, we got about 30 seconds left. Let's do a little prediction thing here. Yeah. Who wins that primary? I think Brnovich wins the primary. What do you think, Steve? Brnovich. You think Brnovich wins it I as do. well? Absolutely. All right, I Mike. still think Horn. I think I think he's got name ID and and he's been savvy enough in other in other races that he holds on less odds in the general. People certainly have underestimated him before. Yeah. And, uh, and, well, Brnovich is also going after the right wing. The same people we were talking about, the, the party faithful here. And the again, ones who censor we, John McCain. Ones who censor John McCain, <laughs> but are who are the people who sometimes turn out in the primaries? All right. Good stuff, guys. Good to have you here. 
Monday on Arizona Horizon, Arizona Superintendent of Public Instruction joins us after he gives his State of Education speech, and we'll see how a 70-year-old facility is having a big impact on the American Indian community. That's Monday evening, 5, 30, and 10 on Arizona Horizon. Tuesday, a discussion on the future of global climate policy. Wednesday, our weekly legislative update with the Arizona Capital Times. Thursday, hear what art advocates have to say after a policy meeting with state lawmakers. And Friday, it's another edition of the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.